All right, hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. So this is lecture video 10. In this video, we're gonna talk about issues that are related to memory. So last video, we talked about attention. This video, we'll discuss memory. And then in the next video, we'll talk about several other cognitive processes, things like creativity, critical thinking, that sort of thing. So you will have activity eight that's going to be discussed in the lecture video. So please let me know if you have questions about the material or about the assignment. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so as I said today, we're gonna to be carrying on talking about the information processing approach, we're really talking about cognitive psychology here. So we've talked about attention. Today, we're gonna to be talking about memory. So we'll have a little bit of information about different types of memory. And I will also talk about ways to get information into your memory and to keep it there. So we'll have some from your textbook, but I will also include some personal tips as well. Before I do that though, there is a question. Whenever we talk about memory and we talk about the classroom, probably the thing that comes to mind is rote memorization. Now, when I use the term rote memorization, I'm basically talking about memorizing information as it is without really including uh, creativity or critical thinking or application, just memorizing the information exactly as it is. So road memorization is something that people have come to look down upon quite a bit for several different reasons. Um, and I think this is not necessarily a good thing. So I do want to say a couple of things about rote memorization. One is that there are certain things that just have to be memorized and that maybe we can incorporate some songs that help us memorize or play some games to help students review. We can make it fun, we can make it interesting, but at the end of the day there are certain things that people just need to know. So things like the state capitals and your multiplication tables and uh, the presidents of the United States, or whatever it is, there are certain things that we need to know in order to then be able to accomplish other tasks later. So, memorization in and of itself is not a bad thing. I think it depends on your view of education. So, I personally have a more classical view of education. And without going into any great detail, the classical view of education splits education up into different distinct stages based on uh, developmental level. So during that first stage, which is called the grammar stage, which is traditionally thought of as the first through fourth grade, a classical model would really emphasize memorization here. The idea being that children are like sponges, right? They memorize information very easily during this time period. If you don't think this is true, uh, curse in front of your child once. Trust me, he or she will remember. Uh, but they memorize the lyrics to songs. They memorize the words in their favorite books. And so during this time period, memorization is easy for them. But in addition to that, the other skills are not so easy for them. You need a certain level of cognitive development in order to be able to engage in things like creativity, critical thinking, application. So the idea with the classical model is that if you fill up a child with information that maybe they don't understand perfectly, but somewhat fill up a child with information during that first stage, then in the later stages they'll have that information to draw from as they become able to make connections. So then, instead of just memorizing the time periods where a certain war happened, you can talk about why the war happened during that time period. And you can talk about the good things and the bad things about each side, that kind of thing. You can't have that conversation necessarily with a younger child because they're not ready for it. But if the older child has not been exposed to those dates or that time period, then it'll be hard to have that conversation with them as well. So there definitely is a time and a place for memorization. I will say that sometimes we can take this too far. I think that uh, eventually this could end up looking like teaching to the test. Just memorize these facts so that you can make a certain score in a test and then move on with your life and, and not really make those deeper connections. But I think that if rote memorization is a first step to later being able to make connections, then that's a good thing. All right, so what do I mean when I say memory? Well, a general definition here would be the retention of information over time. Now, this is a very general information because we could take this definition in many different directions. So, first of all, retention over time. Well, how long? Are we talking about 
a very short period of time, a few seconds, or a long period of time? Well, it could be either. Are we talking about information that is verbal, information that is um, visual, auditory, uh, even smells and tastes? You remember things over time. So th this is a general definition that encompasses many different areas, but there is a basic process here where with memory you go through three stages encoding, storage, and retrieval. So first you have to get information into memory. If you don't encode the information then you won't be able to retrieve it later. So I touched on this a little bit in the attention lecture but let's say for example you're not paying attention when the teacher is lecturing. You're, maybe you're not trying to learn the information or maybe you have competing information coming in. You're watching TV while you're reading your textbook at the same time. If you do not encode information, or if you encode it in a way that is inaccurate, uh, then certainly you will not be able to store that information and retrieve it over time. However, even if you are able to encode that information, once you have it, you have to be able to store it. Store it for how long? There are certain things that perhaps you think, I just need to remember this for the next 30 seconds. I just need to remember this phone number while I find a pen to write it down. Uh, something like that. And then there are certain things when you're like, I want to remember this forever. This is a big thing. This is important. This is a really important moment in my life and I want to remember this forever. So you have to retain that information for some period of time and also you have to be able to retrieve it. Sometimes we get information in and we store it, but we feel like we have a difficult time accessing that information. Like it's on the tip of my tongue, I can almost remember it, it's so close, but maybe you have a hard time getting to that information. Maybe that's what it feels like for you when you take a test. You know that you got the information in there, you know that you stored it, but yet you're having a hard time retrieving it when you need it to be able to take the test, which could happen for any number of reasons. It could be because you're anxious. So one thing to do during a test is just deep breathing, you know, progressive muscle relaxation, uh, whatever works for you guys to help calm you down that will help improve retrieval. Uh, but also practicing retrieving the information. So this is a great study tip. We'll get to this in a second. But testing yourself on the information before you actually get to the test, it's a really great way to study. So three basic steps here, encoding, storage, and retrieval get it in, keep it in for as long as you need it, and then be able to access it and use it. So how do we get information into our brains? You guys probably want to know this as college students, this is relevant, but also if you're going to be teaching, you want to find ways to help your students encode information as well. So let's touch on a few things here, first of all, that are mentioned in your book. So rehearsal. The constant repetition of information over time. Rehearsal is something that is especially helpful for keeping information in your short-term memory, which we'll talk about the different time periods of memory in just a second. But it's very helpful for keeping things for a shorter period of time. Sometimes rehearsal is not super effective for getting information into your long-term memory, especially if it's a large amount of information. There's only a certain amount of information that you can repeat. So if you're learning your state capitals, you really can't sit down and repeat all 50 of them very quickly, right? So that's something that might be works for a phone number or that kind of thing, a small piece of information. Constructing images. You will remember things better if you can imagine them, if you have an image to go with them. They do this research by uh, calling out words to people and then not letting them write them down until the end of the list and then when they're done calling out the words and they say okay write the words down people typically remember the words that allow for an image so if I say the word pizza an image comes into mind you know what pizza looks like however if I say the word therefore therefore is not really a word that you necessarily have an image for so if you can find a way to attach an image to a fact that you're memorizing that kind of thing that's helpful of course paying attention while trying to encode the information this sounds obvious but it's not always think about the ways that we study sometimes sometimes we do try to cram in our information all at one time which is not a good thing the best way to study 
uh, which is hard depending on how much time you have before a test, but the best way to study is to start studying early and spread out your studying as much as possible because your attention span is not going to make it. Uh, cramming, although it feels natural, is not good for your brain. Instead of staying up studying for two hours, you just start studying a few days early and spread your studying out. If at all possible, that's a great thing to do. I know summer classes and other situations might make that hard, but if at all possible, that's a great thing to do because your attention span is not going to make it for a two-hour cram session. I don't care how many Red Bulls you drink, which be cautious with how many Red Bulls you drink. But make sure you're paying attention. So. If you're trying to watch a lecture video or read a textbook, you don't need to have other verbal things going on at the same time. So watching TV, listening to music that has lyrics in it, that kind of thing, or trying to carry on a conversation with another person also, unless maybe you're talking about the material you're studying, in which case that might be okay. All right. Elaboration kind of goes along with deep processing. Basically, anything that you... Uh, do with the information will make it easier for you to remember it. So one thing you can do is elaborate on it. Come up with your own specific examples, perhaps. So when I start talking about different types of memory, think about memories that you have that fall into the different categories. You'll remember your own examples a lot better than you'll remember my examples. So elaborate. Make specific bits of information more distinctive with your own personal thoughts, opinions, examples, etc. Which is a way of deep processing. Deep processing basically is making connections. So you might make connections with uh, opinions or memories that you have, examples that you have, but you might also make connections with other classes. Maybe you've had some similar information or maybe when you learn the information in one class, another class makes more sense, that kind of thing. And so making connections between what we're doing in class and other parts of your life would also help you to learn this information more quickly. Organizing this information. And it talks about chunking here, which is basically just putting together things that go together, bits of information that make sense to go together, and kind of learning them as a unit instead of trying to learn them separately. There are lots of different ways that people do organization. Um, I've heard of students using different color highlighters or different colored pens for different lecture videos or different lectures. Um, one thing, one word of uh, advice about highlighting though, I would be cautious with highlighting uh, because sometimes we go through and we end up highlighting so much that we're not really making um, that much of a difference. We're kind of just highlighting the entire textbook. And so at that point, it's not super helpful. Uh, but finding a way to organize the information. So one thing you might do is study in different locations. So maybe you say, well, I studied the information from the memory lecture in my dorm room, and I studied the information on the attention lecture at the library. And so Different locations might help freshen up your attention span and also help you when you're trying to remember information, might give you extra cues for that. So I personally do recommend that you start studying as soon as possible and study a little bit every day instead of cramming all at once. I also recommend that you do more than just read through notes. The problem with just reading through your notes is that they might start to look familiar over time, even if they're not really as familiar as you think. So you remember having read it before, that doesn't necessarily mean you know it well enough to remember it on a test. So instead, I recommend reading through your notes a couple times and then doing something with that information. So one option might be making your own test. Uh, I give you guys study guides, I give you practice exams, but Make your own study guide. Make your own practice exam. It's a great way to study because if you can come up with a question about the material and answer it, hey, you've really, you've really learned the information at that point. Another great way that wor works for some people anyway is to explain the information to another person. Now, you might have to get this person to sit down. You might have to buy them a beer and a pizza to get them to listen to you talking about your classes, but if you can explain the information to another person, then you probably know it yourself. A uh, couple of thoughts on this. I feel like I have learned a lot since teaching, just because the act of teaching information helps it stick. And also, my poor husband has heard me talk about psychology for so many years now. 
he deserves an honorary degree. He, he knows more psychology than most just because he's been listening to me. But this was the way I studied in grad school was explaining the concepts to my husband. And that worked really well for me. Maybe didn't work as well for him, but I don't suppose I asked his opinion on that. Love you, hon. All right, anyway. Now, talking about the different time frames of memory. So we've talked about the steps of memory. We have to encode it, get it in. We have to store it for an appropriate amount of time. And then we have to be able to retrieve it. Now, when we're talking about an appropriate amount of time, there are three time frames for memory. And so we're going to talk about them on this slide, but then you'll also see uh, a, an illustration of this on the next slide. So first of all, we have sensory memory. So just like it sounds, sensory memory involves any information coming in through your senses. And some of this we may not even be aware of. But all the information coming in through our senses, whether that be touch and taste and smell or uh, hearing or vision, all that information is stored for a very brief period of time. It cannot be stored forever because that's a ton of information at any one time. Uh, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, your brain actually works pretty hard to abstract out a lot of that if it's not relevant. Have you ever noticed that when you walk into a room, you smell what that room smells like, and then within a couple of minutes, perhaps, you don't smell it anymore? Or maybe there's a noise in the background, the air conditioner going, or a clock ticking, and you hear it at first, but you stop hearing it. It's because your brain filters out that information that's not really necessary. And the same thing happens here. So with sensory memory, all this information is brought in very, very quickly uh, into your senses and held for a brief period of time. So sensory memory has a very brief time period, but a large capacity. Everything coming in through your senses is held briefly. Now, I say briefly, let me give you an example. Um, it's a little bit longer for um, auditory information, so something you've heard. So your sensory memory for hearing might last four or five seconds, perhaps, which is why sometimes if you're having a conversation with someone and you start, you're like, what? What did you say? And they go, oh, and it catches up with you because you're still able to access the last maybe four to five seconds of what you heard. Uh, it's actually much shorter for your vision. Um, there was one study that looked at this that found like one twentieth of a second Everything you see is held in your brain for 1 20th of a second. So it's a very brief time period. What happens then is that your brain, by way of attention, selects which things it's going to keep and which things it's going to get rid of. The things that you don't pay attention to are gone. And you can't really retrieve them at that point. But the things that you pay attention to will then move into your short-term memory. Now. Once information is into your short-term memory, so it came in through your senses, you paid attention to it, now it's in your short-term memory. As we said, short-term here, so it's not held there very long. It has 30 seconds here. 30 seconds is pretty generous, um, but I would say no more than 30 seconds without rehearsal. So I said that rehearsal is a way to keep information into in your short-term memory. So if, for example, you're trying to remember a phone number, until you can find your phone to type it in or find something to write down the phone number on, if you just say that phone number over and over and over again, theoretically, you could keep it in your short-term memory forever until someone distracts you or something else comes into your short-term memory and bumps it out. So without rehearsing it, you'll lose it in about 30 seconds. Also, short-term memory has a limited capacity, so it's not able to hold too many things. Sensory memory has a much shorter duration than short-term memory, but it has a larger capacity. With short-term memory, it depends a little bit. Every person's capacity is different because some people are better uh, at memory tasks than others, but usually it's somewhere between five to nine items. Uh, you might hear seven plus or minus two, which is just a way of saying about five to nine items is the maximum for most people that you can hold in your short-term memory. Now, if you manage to get information into your long-term memory, which we already talked about ways to do this, so make it distinctive, come up with your own examples, teach it to someone else, um, maybe uh, making your own test, uh, 
organizing the information in some way, whatever you do to get it into long-term memory. Once you get information into long-term memory, long-term memory is going to have the largest capacity and the largest duration, which means that it will have a basically unlimited capacity for an extremely long period of time. Now, this doesn't feel right though. If you've had these experiences, maybe you've had a test and you've been studying for this information for so long. Maybe you've been studying, maybe um, like for example, if you're studying for the GRE, maybe you've been studying for months and yet it feels like you hit a, a limit with your capacity sometimes. It feels like if I shove one more fact into my brain, I'm going to forget some of the other facts. It just feels like there's a limit there. That may be what our experience is like, but truly your long-term memory has, um, if it has a capacity, we haven't exactly defined it yet. It's an extremely large capacity over a long period of time. Now, we don't know exactly how long that is. Um, some things will last longer than others. And of course, your memory can be impacted by um, cognitive issues. So we know that as we age, uh, cognitive abilities tend to decline a little bit. And then things like dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and others can impact your memory. But for the most part, our long-term memories are very robust. All right, now, when you see these terms here, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, we're really referring to Atkinson and Schifrin's theory. So they were the ones who kind of coined these terms and theorized that this is the way that memory works. So this is basically just a graph to look at to tell you some of the things we talked about on the previous slide. So you have your sensory input come in. This is literally everything that comes in through your senses. So it's a large amount of information not as much as long-term memory, but a large amount of information that comes in and is held in sensory memory for a very brief duration. And it does depend a little bit whether you're talking about things like auditory memory or visual memory, but a very short duration. Now, most of the things that make it into your sensory memory will be discarded after that time period, whether it be a few seconds, somewhere in there, or even less. If you don't pay attention to it, it will be discarded and it's gone. However, the things that we pay attention to will make it into our short-term memory. Now, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about working memory in our intelligence discussion. Working memory is basically short-term memory that has an extra component to it where instead of just holding the information, you're manipulating it. You're doing something with it, but very similar to short-term memory. So we pay attention to something, it gets into our short-term memory, and then from there, there are a few things that can happen. First of all, you could lose it. And if you hold that information in short-term memory and don't do anything with it, you will lose it, a maximum of perhaps 30 seconds. You could rehearse the information. Rehearsing the information is just saying it out loud, maybe you're saying it to yourself over and over and over again. That will keep it in short-term memory. That's not a great strategy to get it into long-term memory, but it will hold it in your short-term memory for as long as you're able to rehearse it without being interrupted. However, most things that we're trying to remember, we'd really like to get into our long-term memory. So there are different ways to do that. As I said, make it distinctive, come up with your own examples. All the things we talked about earlier, get it into your long-term memory. Now, once you have information in your long-term memory, it has a very large capacity, basically unlimited, and a very long duration, but you need to be able to retrieve it. You need to be able to access it. Once you access information from your long-term memory, you're essentially bringing it into your short-term memory, which is where you can do something with it, where you can use it. Um, we might be thinking about working memory here, about bringing something out of long-term memory and doing something with it. Now, when we're talking about long-term memory, there are a couple of different things that we could be thinking about. So, with long-term memory, you're looking back on everything that you remember from your entire lifespan, which is longer for some of us than others, but you guys make me feel old. But it is a long period of time for all of us who are listening to this lecture video. So, a lot of information in your long-term memory. Now, your long-term memory can break down into a couple of categories. 
on the one hand you have declarative memory and then on the other hand you have procedural memory both of these are important but probably declarative memory is the one that we think about when we think about memory declarative memory would be facts it would be stories the declarative says that you can tell someone else about this information Procedural memory is not necessarily something you can describe, not necessarily something you can tell another person, but it's something that your body knows how to do. So, for example, riding a bicycle. You might not really be able to describe exactly how to ride a bicycle, but your muscles know how to ride a bicycle. They, you know, if you get off the horse, you get thrown off the horse, you're supposed to get back on the horse. So, muscle memory would be an example here. Uh, writing, you get used to writing. And so without even thinking about it until you have to teach a kindergartner how to start writing and how to start forming letters, then you just write without thinking about it. That's procedural memory. And so it's not necessarily tied into specific uh, memories that you can tell other people about. So let's have a couple examples. Declarative memory, I could tell you the story of the first time I ever rode a bicycle. It was a catastrophe. I thought I would know how to do it and I went up on the top of the hill and went down the hill, fell off, and then got angry and refused to ride my bicycle until training wheels were put back on. You know, I was that kind of kid. That is a memory that I have, a declarative memory that I can tell you, but procedural memory would be the fact that my legs, my muscles, probably, I'm assuming it's been a long time, probably remember how to ride a bicycle. That's just something that uh, is a procedure that I have memorized. Now, declarative memory can also then break down into a couple of different types. Declarative memory in general is information, something you can explain to another person. Episodic memory would be information that is specific to you. So you have memories about what you did for your last birthday, or what you did for Christmas last year, or you have memories about your childhood, perhaps falling off of bicycles and humiliating yourself, right? You have these memories. Those are episodic memories. Semantic memory refers to memorizing information that is not unique to you, but more like generalized information. So if you can tell me the state capital of Indiana, or if you can tell me what three times four is, that's something that you've memorized and you can tell me about it, it's declarative, you can tell me about it, but it's not personal to you, it's more general information. So all of these things would be included in long-term memory. Now, we know that an individual who has had uh, certain kinds of brain damage, so perhaps an accident or a stroke, might lose some of this. So sometimes when a person has had some kind of traumatic brain injury, they might have to relearn procedures. They might have to learn how to walk again. They might have to learn how to write again. Uh, and we also know that there are situations where a person might lose memory, might not be able to access um, memories they've had before, or people who might not be able to form new memories. So certainly there are issues that can come up with these. Now when we're talking about retrieving information from memory, there are several different um, ways that we can go about doing this. First of all, I want to focus on recall and recognition. I'm going to come back to serial position effect because this is going to have to do with your activity. So there are different types of retrieval involved depending on the task. And so a couple that we're going to talk about here would be recall and recognition. Recall is when you are retrieving information from memory without prompts right in front of you. Recognition would be retrieving information from memory when the answer is in front of you. You just have to choose which one of these is right. So for example, an essay test or a fill-in-the-blank test or a short answer test, that would be recall. There's a question you have to answer, but as far as the material for the answer goes, you don't have a prompt right in front of you. You don't have something to look at. So recall requires you to completely produce the information yourself. Recognition, on the other hand, uh, refers to recalling, or I shouldn't say recalling because that's confusing. I just talked about recall. Retrieving, I should say, information from your long-term memory when you have something to look at. So, for example, multiple choice or matching. So the right answer is in front of you. You just have to recognize which one of the answer choices is the right answer. Now, 
We're going to be talking about different types of assessments um, at the end of this section of the class. And typically when I talk to students, they often tell me they like recognition better. So students might feel more confident with something like multiple choice or matching. It feels like the answer is in front of you. All you have to do is recognize it. All you have to do is somehow bring it back. On the other hand, though, I think students often do well on recall tests, and this could be for a few reasons. It could be that our recall memory is better than we think it is, and we're just not as confident with it, but it's still pretty good. Or it could be that the way that you encode information is different if you know how you're going to have to retrieve it. So you study differently for an essay test than you do for a multiple choice test. And certainly it is helpful to know what kind of test you are preparing for. So I think students typically like recognition best, but I think that both of these are important. So when I was in college, I actually took a memory class and it was, it was a really interesting class. Uh, and I thought it was interesting the way that the teacher did the test. So uh, we would have a portion of the test that would be more recognition memory, and then we would have a portion of the test that was more recall memory, and so it was more like essay questions. And for the recall section, she would let us bring in a note card. We couldn't use that note card for the recognition part of the test, but we could use that note card for the recall portion. And basically, she had specific instructions about how large the note card could be but you could put anything you wanted on it. And so you can you know, go through when you're studying and write down whatever you wanted and you can use that. And what I actually found, and I'm sure she knew what she was doing, was I didn't need that note card. After I had spent days agonizing over what information I wanted to put on my note card, I actually knew it well enough that I didn't really need the note card anymore. So it was a pretty good way of studying. So maybe try that don't use note cards in classes if teachers don't allow it, that's called cheating. But as a way to study, take the notes, put them in your own words, that kind of thing could be helpful for you. Now, coming back to the serial position effect, it says that recall is better at the beginning and the end of a list. This is the idea that we tend to remember the things in the beginning and the things at the end, but we lose the stuff in the middle. There's a couple of ways that this could play out. For one, if I were to have you listen to a list of words, and when I finish the list, you write the words down, people typically remember the first few items and the last few items, and they miss the things in the middle. And the reason for that is because if you know that you're going to be asked to write these words down, you're rehearsing them in your brain. So those first few words get rehearsed several times, and that helps you hang on to that memory a little bit. But at a certain point, you've heard so many words that you can't rehearse them all anymore and your brain gives up. You're overwhelmed. I can't hold this anymore. And you stop rehearsing. And so you lose the things in the middle. But you're usually able to get the things at the end because of sensory memory, right? So we said that we hold the last four to five seconds of auditory information in our sensory memory. So if the person calls off the last two or three words and then says, okay, stop, write down the words, You'll remember those because you just heard them. Another way this could play out could be in the classroom, though. If you're listening to a lecture, you tend to remember the things at the very beginning of the lecture and the things at the very end of the lecture, and you tend to lose the things in the middle. And this is what I want you to be thinking about for your Activity 8. So it says, first of all, describe the serial position effect. This is just letting me know that you understand what I'm talking about when I say serial position effect. But in addition to that, how could you use that information to improve your teaching? So how could you help students memorize facts, knowing that they lose the facts in the middle? Maybe you, all, you switch up the order. Or maybe you do something to make the things in the middle distinctive. Maybe you do something in the middle of class that helps your students refocus their attention taking breaks, that kind of thing. But I want you guys to show me that you can use this information to help improve your teaching. One other example of the serial position effect, sometimes when I teach in-person classes, I do this with the presidents. So I'll ask the students to write down as many presidents as they can think of uh, from the United States. I have to clarify that. 
in any order that comes to them. And oftentimes what happens is that students will remember the first few presidents and the most recent presidents, and they'll miss the ones in the middle, except for a few. Usually uh, presidents like Lincoln and Kennedy, even though they're more towards the middle of the list, people remember them because they're distinctive. So if there's something you can do to make the middle of the list distinctive, then people will typically be able to remember that as well. So that's your activity eight. Kind of wrapping up today's lecture, talking about improving memory. So if you're a teacher, you want to help your students be able to remember information. First of all, promote understanding. You really can't remember something if you don't understand it. So think about listening to a song in another language that you don't speak. You can listen to that song over and over again, but you probably won't memorize it because it doesn't make sense to you. So making sure that students understand the concept will help them remember the information. Uh, vary the way that you teach the information. So teaching the same information in several different ways. So maybe, as I said earlier, we listen to some songs, we play some games, we work in groups, come up with a group project, find a way to apply the information. So vary the way that you teach it. And also, if there is an application here, or if there's some kind of connection between what you're memorizing and what they already know, if there's some way to perhaps make it visual. So if you're learning the state capitals, like looking at the states, the shape of the states. If you're learning your times tables, then putting up some kind of math manipulative that people can see will be really helpful. Also helping students to organize knowledge. I think this gets easier the more experience we have. So typically as we get older, we get better at this, but helping students organize information. Um, this is just basic study skills. Teaching mnemonics. The word mnemonic is basically just a memory trick. And you may have examples of this that you can think of on your own, but teaching rhymes, acronyms, keywords. Um, so maybe you learned the colors of the rainbow, like Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, something like that. You remember it because of a mnemonic that someone taught you. And so if you're able to think of these, or even better, have the kids brainstorm and think of their own mnemonic, be really helpful. And embedding memory retrieval language, the best way to do this, I think, is to test yourself. It's to practice with the information. Not just reading flashcards over and over again, but make your own test. If there, you know another student who's taking the class, then test each other. Or if you can find someone who will listen to you, explain the concept to them. So you practice retrieving the, the um, information before the test actually happens so you'll feel more confident about it when test day arrives. All right, so that is the end of our lecture on memory. So don't forget about activity eight. Let me know if you have any questions about the material. Our next lecture video is gonna carry on talking about cognitive processes, but we'll talk about some more advanced cognitive processes, things like critical thinking, problem solving, that kind of thing. So let me know if you need anything, and I will talk to you guys in the next lecture video.